My name is Craig McAllister. I'm the interim provost at Rollins College, and what a wonderful pleasure it is to welcome you to the initial inauguration activity for Rollins College's 15th president. <laughs> Several housekeeping notes before we get started. If you have one of these, you might want to put it on vibrate or turn it off. It's a lot more fun. Uh, also, you should have gotten some little uh, index cards. Uh, what we'll do is uh, when the panelists are over, we will pick up the cards for questions, and then uh, we will give these questions to the panelists. And so now it's a wonderful opportunity to welcome you to the first of two panels on liberal education, presented in conjunction with tomorrow's inauguration. We're honored today to have in this first panel entitled What Matters in Colleges, four distinguished presidents or presidents emeritus that uh, are going to talk to us today and I'll only introduce them briefly because the more you hear from them, the better. And, uh, but it is very important that uh, we recognize our distinguished panel. The first person I will recognize is Dr. Richard Garassi. There's an Italian way to pronounce that, but I chose not to. <laughs> he is the president of Wagner College and chair of Campus Compact. Our second panelist is uh, Carol Geary Schneider, president of the American Association of Colleges and Universities, or as we affectionately call it, AACNU. Dr. Daniel Sullivan, president emeritus of St. Lawrence University and senior advisor to the president and advancement fellow, AACNU. And our facilitator, Dr. Lynn Pascarella, president of Mount Holyoke College and president-elect of AACNU. So as I said, I will be asking for these cards towards the end of their presentation. And with that, Dr. Pascarella, welcome. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it really is such an honor and privilege to be here to celebrate with all of you uh, Grant's installation and to be with this panel of <laughs> extraordinary leaders in higher education who have spent their careers demonstrating a deep and abiding commitment to excellence in liberal education and to access to that excellence. I want to begin by uh, talking a bit about the, the state of American higher education and the state of politics a across the country. It, it seems that we have had a, a remarkable shift away from the notion of higher education as a public good and it's now viewed increasingly as a private commodity. And I'm hoping that our panelists can talk a bit about how to address the growing concern that, um, that we're really not doing our job, that there's no real value added in higher education. So how do you, how do you convince the skeptics that liberal education is essential for democratic participation in our society? <laughs> uh, you'll hear really exciting response to that from my two colleagues to my right, and from Lynn herself, who spent a good amount of time making this case. But let me speak specifically to Rollins about this. So a place like Rollins is not about transaction. This is not a transactional education. This is a transformative education. And the more we can make the case about transformation in terms of the way you develop what I'll call the arts of, of a liberal education, developing critical thinking and writing skills and all the things we talk about. And for my world, the civic world, also merge that to the arts of democracy, of how one engages the world purposefully, is really changing the dialogue to some degree. And more specifically, without taking too much time on this, uh, the work that, that I'm involved with with Campus Compact and with Wagner College and other institutions I work with is about really addressing the needs of distressed communities. And it's really about making the difference in our, in our world where learning is purposeful, we're building what we call civic professionals, you call them global citizens, uh, and in which they're learning how to not only make use of the breadth and depth of a liberal education and the arts and applied, beautiful applied uh, skills of a professional education as well, but able to put that in service of others and really become a full human being and a full citizen. So, Moving the, the narrative from being, this is about getting a degree so you can increase your income, to this is about how you become, a, not just a lifelong learner, but an engaged citizen in a democracy in peril, as we all know and see, 
and a way in which you can use that knowledge not only to advance your own career and your professional aspirations, but also be in service and engage with others so you help lift the society with them, not for them. That's the, that's the narrative we need. Well, you and I have talked about this uh, many times, Lynn, uh, because as has already been said, Lynn is going to take the helm of the association that I head uh, in July, and uh, so we are doing a lot of talking. Um, <laughs> And we are the association that has committed itself for over 100 years to advancing liberal education and making the excellence of liberal education inclusive, not exclusive. So I want to say three things in, in response to your question, none of which are new because you, we've talked about them a lot. The first is that we've concluded that you can't start with a civic argument. You should be able to start with a civic argument. The roots of liberal education in the US tell us about the direct connections between a free, self-governing democracy and the education of people who have the capacities and the commitment to take responsibility for that. But we are so far away from any dialogue whatsoever in our society about the public good, the public square, the public trust, that you actually have to start with where people are. And there are two places to start before you get to the civic mission. So the first is to, to show that no employers are asking for people who are narrowly trained, <laughs> who lack uh, analytical, problem-solving, evidence-based reasoning, communication skills, who know nothing about diversity and can't deal with the actual people they're working with and for, um, uh, people who are indifferent to the global economy that we're part of. Employers are not asking for that. Employers are our best friends in making the case that of course you need the key outcomes of a liberal education to get into that economy, to persist in a turbulent economy, to contribute to the innovation, which is the character. Our economy is where it's succeeding. It's succeeding because it's innovative. And where it's not innovating, it's failing. So you have to show that employers want this and that students are getting, as Richard has smartly said, the kind of transformative, inventive, experimental education that you're good at at Rollins, that you're really good at at Rollins. Uh, and having said all that, you then go to the disparity issue. Mm -hmm. Because we, show, we can show so clearly, so empir empirically in our society that the people most likely to get that opportunity creating education are the people who come from the top income quartiles. Uh, below the top income quartile, only a third of students are even getting degrees in the second quartile. In the third quartile, 17%. And in the bottom quartile, it's 9%. Crawled up over the last half century from 6%. So we are so stratified as a society in our access to any version of a college degree, much less to access to the broad opportunity creating education I've just talked about. And I think our, our nation is ready, obviously, if you're paying any attention at all to the politics of the moment, is ready to talk about the disparity question and who has access to what and how we make college valuable for those who need it for their future and who are not getting it uh, in any kind of uh, Quantity. And all that said, I think you can then come back to the connections that are historic, that are contemporary, that are global, between building capacity to be a global community, to be a responsible democracy, to take seriously the responsibilities that we as the most powerful uh, democracy in the world, most powerful nation in the world, have in the global community. Uh, all the problems that I know are in, talked about daily in a Rollins education, the sustainability of our planet, our communities, all those things can come up, but I honestly do think you have to start with where people are, and where they are is economically anxious. Picking, picking up on both of those, uh, both of those themes, I think, I think we've managed to, to, to help the country not talk its way through this, in our, through our own behavior over a long period of time. Um, everybody, I think the employers, uh, believe we should be educating students who, are, who um, have achieved the, the kinds of learning goals that, that, that uh, Carol has, has talked about. But we have tended to assume that they're implicit, that we've, we've in a sense left them uh, embedded and tacit in, in what we do and largely focus on disciplinary con content. In a liberal arts college, that disciplinary content tends to be uh, liberal arts dis disciplines and pre-professional and professional education. It's the professional learning uh, that, needs to, that needs to go on. Uh, some, some liberal arts uh, disciplines are sort of natural sites for 
analysis and inquiry and integrative learning and so on and so forth, but not all of them are easily. And even, even in our teaching uh, in the disciplines that are natural sites for these higher order learning goals, we tend to leave them implicit. If you look at syllabi that faculty, faculty produce, they're rich, richly uh, annotated with regard to the content that, that students uh, uh, are expected to learn <clears throat> and when in the course that content is going to, is going to show up. Uh, rarely do you see embedded in syllabi uh, the expectation that students will uh, grow in their critical thinking skills, that they will improve in their quantitative reasoning skills. And so uh, uh, to some extent we've contributed to this problem and we've especially contributed it, uh, to it because uh, we have been hi historically unwilling to try to assess where students are with respect to their uh, competencies in those in those areas. The the, the notion that uh, uh, assessment already happens in a natural way as part of part of courses, but of course that assessment is uh, typically it's grading, and it's focused uh, on uh, sort of the entirety of what the course is about, and, and again rarely explicitly assessment that uh, tells us anything about how someone uh, does critical thinking. So. We, we've left a vacuum there. We've let the country uh, define us uh, by the content that we do or do not teach. And we find ourselves defending ourselves on, on uh, if, if, so, if somebody, uh, one of my favorite ways of saying it is that uh, uh, it's hard in this kind of political environment to, to defend the liberal arts disciplines that, that people uh, react against politically. But even George Will thinks everybody should be good at analysis. Everybody ought to be able to pull <laughs> things together. Everybody ought to uh, uh, evidence, uh, have, have good evidence-based reasoning skills. They should be good oral communicators. They should be ethical. And, and so we've left that terrain. Uh, and, and because we've been unwilling to assess our, our success at teaching those things, uh, we have no evidence to give the society. Uh, I, I started my career at Carleton College. It's a fabulous place. Uh, they do, they're doing wonderful things in writing across the curriculum. But the president of Carleton College can't say to anyone with any, any definitive evidence that students write better when they leave Carleton than they did when they came. And our inability to answer those legitimate questions uh, that uh, parents and the rest of the society are asking of us uh, contribute to the dilemma that we're in. So, I guess the conclusion I want to, want to leave you on this is we have to address that. We have to get on that. It's not simple. It's not quick. We're going to, we're going to experience uh, continued criticism until we get there. Uh, but, but we can really stand together in defense of those learning goals, and we can devise appropriate uh, means for assessing them that build on the work that students actually do, uh, that it's credible to our faculty, credible to parents, and so on and so forth. And I, so that's part of, the, part of the answer. Carol is absolutely right that the place the societies, the, the opening they're giving us is, is uh, what, what the employers are telling us. And the other opening is nobody likes the, the inequality uh, that they see. So that's, that's some comments. Great. After my appointment was announced as president-elect of AACNU, I was invited by Inside Higher Ed to write a piece. And I, I focused on Marco Rubio's statement that we need um, more welders and, and less philosophers. And um, I, I noted in this piece you that... You should tell them your PhD. It's in philosophy. <laughs> and, um, and grants. Uh, yes, you know. and grants. And, and my father was a welder, so I was particularly interested in this. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so I said, we can spend time mocking his grammar, and we can provide statistics that show that philosophers actually make as much as, if not more, than welders. But in doing so, we ignore the underlying message. That is, education is too difficult to access, it's too expensive, and it doesn't teach people 21st century skills. And I would love it if you could say something about why you think this argument uh, that Rubio made resonates so deeply with so many people, that the way to go to make America stronger is to push vocational education and, and what we're losing when we make that case? Well, at the risk of injecting partisanship into Grant's inauguration, for which I apologize, uh, the arguments against the liberal arts are coming from one side of the spectrum, and only parts of that. 
Um, as Dan has just said, George Will is not arguing for dropping liberal education. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's throughout my tenure as head of AACNU, what seemed to me one of the few places where the right and the left actually agreed was that the liberal education mattered. So it's just recently, and it's been a very selective assault on the humanities, on some of the social sciences, on unnecessary things like gender studies, because of course the problems of women in the world have been solved, right? <laughs> um, so it's rather selective, and I think it's something important for you to know. Um, we have swallowed deeply at AACNU. We, have, we share all the values that your new president cares about, that you care about, the commitment to social justice, to global citizenship, all of those things. But we finally said we have to show the people who get liberal arts degrees are not actually in the poorhouse. Mm -hmm. So, and this is in fact easily shown. So we published with another research center a study showing the career trajectories and the salary trajectories over time of people who majored in the humanities, social sciences, arts, one cluster, sciences, another cluster, professional fields, a third, and then engineering, which really is a zone unto itself in terms of salaries and should never be combined with science because it, it tilts the, the data up. So what we show is in fact that the people with humanities and social sciences degrees do well financially over time and actually exceed people with professional degrees. But what we also saw that I hadn't known before, and I think it's important for you to know, is that those degrees are shoring up the social service fabric of right. this democracy. People who major in the humanities and in the social sciences and history and philosophy and arts, they're going into not-for-profits, they're going into schools, they're going into administration and government, they're going into public service, uh, they're going into teaching. Uh, the twelfth most common uh, employment category for that set of majors is, is uh, the clergy. So if we were to shred our society and our world of people who have majored in the humanities, social sciences, mm -hmm. uh, and the arts, we would deplete the social fabric of this democracy in the most incredibly destructive way. And I think this is, um, the fact that we published it doesn't mean it's widely understood. <laughs> we, we know that. I think that this is there to be built on, to, to capture and, and praise and parade, proclaim, which I know Grant will be very good at doing, <laughs> the uh, extent to which a liberal education is building social capacity for the future of our democracy on for solving the problems we need to solve. I would just add the obvious is that if you look at just the material impact of an education, we know there's a million dollar plus bonus over a lifetime. All the data on the material aspects of being educated properly or not, or uneducated, I think I saw statistics, some of the effect, the two that were really profound to me. Uh, one was that if you're an African American male in the United States, and you're not on the third grade reading level by the third grade, never mind following all the way through to a college education, you have an 80% greater chance of going to prison in your life. Think about that statistic. Think about how that determines the life pattern. And then if you look at um, the prison incarceration of, of African American men by education, I think if you, have, if you do not have a high school education, uh, your chances of going to prison sometime in your lifetime are something like 65 to 70% as an African American male. If you have a high school education, it drops to around 30 or 28 percent. If you have a college education, it drops to 7 percent. So just in those very vivid ways, and the other thing I'll just say is I was reading in the Chronicle an article by the president of Roger Williams, you probably saw this in the op-ed op part. So if you look at this punishing narrative, um, public higher education in the last 20 years, the net price of public education over 20 years, that is after the discount for financial aid and the like, has gone up in 20 years 43%, but public funding has gone down 48%. And then for private education, over the last 20 years, the net price has gone up 32%, pretty small compared to the gross figures that we see that are exaggerated. And yet, uh, in the last, since 2008, the net price of private education has gone down. So think about where we are. that again, I missed that. So, so the, for, for private, the net price has gone down. What's uh, gone up? Discount, financial aid. Oh, the discount. Yeah. Okay. So right. the, essentially, the public is repricing us. Yeah. Is what we yeah. all, for those yeah. of us in private education, know very vividly, <laughs> right? So. Right. So, so um, I'm going to be bipartisan in my oh, in my, in my uh, this is comments this is about first. comments <laughs> about about politics. One of the when I when I became a, a college president in 1986, the one of the things that I uh, 
totally didn't understand was how much time even a private college president plays in, uh, spends in government relations, state and federal uh, issues, because they're kind of critical to, to how institutions to function. And so early on, I noticed that uh, the only thing worse than having Democrats in power was having Republicans in power. <laughs> and when they were in power, the only thing worse was having Democrats in power. <laughs> because because they, had, they had different but equally uninformed and, and, uh, and destructive views about, about, about higher education. So, Thank you. So my, so my private, <laughs> My private, and I, I have trouble keeping my private thoughts private very long, and so I'm making that transition right now. One of my, <laughs> one, one of my biggest disappointments is, is our, uh, our current president in this way. I'm an, I'm a, I'm an Obama fan in lots of, in lots of ways, uh, but there has been no more energetic spokesperson for exactly what Lynn is talking about than the Department of Education and the president. And uh, the last thing I want, of course, is to have the federal government start defining learning goals and start telling Rollins and St. Lawrence uh, what they should be teaching. And, and of course, that's what they are doing. They're saying we should be teaching less philosophy and less gender studies and getting people. Um, well, but, but there's nothing to keep the president. And, and the president could do this every time he talks about education. He could say, look, you know, we do need job training. We do need uh, to expand the, uh, the safety net for, for workers in, if, if we're going to have a global economy, there are gonna be lots of people hurt by this economy. Uh, somebody was telling me the other night in Germany, um, if you, um, uh, you know, the, the, the safety net is you, you get your entire salary uh, going forward if you're out of work, but you must, you're absolutely required to, to go to school in order to get that to happen. Well, we don't do any of those things. So I, so I think those issues are really important, but every speech the president makes, he could say, um, what we really need to thrive in the 21st century is better analysis, better ev evidence-based reading, reasoning, better quantitative thinking, integrative thinking, real-world problem-solving skills. Uh, and those are things you get in a liberal education. And so whatever else we do as a country, we should be investing at every level of education for everyone, including people who are becoming welders, including people who are becoming electricians. If you're an electrician today, you've got to read complicated specs, you've got to be able to troubleshoot, you've got to be able to take quantitative evidence and think about what the solution to the problem is. Everybody needs those skills. And he, and he could say, that's not our job, you know, but I want you to know, everybody who's listening out there, that we need more of that from you. Employers are saying that, our own government isn't saying that, and, and uh, I so regret it. Well, we know that one of the challenges we face is the growing economic segregation in higher education. More than 50% of college students today begin in community colleges, making them among the most vibrant vectors for delivering a liberal education. And yet, while nearly 85% of students who begin in community colleges report wanting to earn a bachelor's degree, only about 17% do. And, and one out of every two college students in all institutions drops out before completing. Mm -hmm. Um, Carol, you talked about inclusive excellence as a platform of AAC and you. Could you tell us more about what that means? Well, uh, to set it in context, uh, AAC and you just celebrated its centennial, so we are a venerable association. And for the entirety of our history, our mission has been some variant on the theme of su uh, support for liberal education and the institutions that provide it. Uh, in 2012, we after much discussion and building on a long history, expanded our mission to en encompass inclusive excellence. So liberal education and inclusive excellence. And of course, I and you <laughs> think a whole lot about what this actually means. Mm -hmm. So at one level it means that you're trying to provide the most empowering forms of education to everyone who comes into education. And you just said it very nicely. You want to make sure the people in certificate programs, in welding programs, in uh, nursing assistant programs, that they're getting uh, a version of liberal education too, because they need it. They need it to do their jobs that they're preparing for. So uh, you want to make sure the most empowering forms of, of education are offered to everyone. And then we have ladders, very intentional ladders you know, a lot of our degrees in community colleges, they used to be called terminal degrees. Mm -hmm. They were never meant to transfer. Right. They were designed to be endpoints. That's obsolete. We, all of our degrees 
pieces of degrees have to be connected. So, uh, and we have to be very inventive in ways that we haven't been to build those ladders of opportunity. Another is that our institutions have to change. Uh, that the fact of the matter is higher education is the best a preliminary work in prog progress when it comes to being equitably inclusive. Most of our institutions were either built for people who were white uh, and occupied by people who were white until the 1970s, or they were built for people of color uh, with the same patterns. And we are still creating contexts in which we learn how to make the most of our potential to learn with and from one another um, about the difficult equity problems we face as a society. Uh, and that's, so that's a work in progress, and I can go on for an hour with all the things we need to do to actually make our institutions more intentional, better connected. You haven't said, so I'll say it for you, you started at a community college and then went to Mount Holyoke. Right. We need much more of that. We need really rich, robust passageways. I was thinking as I came down here, and I, I don't know the answer to this question, one of the biggest proponents of liberal education and a past chair of AAC and U's board is, is Eduardo Padron, president of Miami-Dade, which is the biggest community college in the country. Right. And they have done a huge amount to advance liberal education across their degree programs. So what, what are the passageways? Are there passageways between Miami-Dade and Rollins? Yes. We have to build those passageways and, and between our schools mm -hmm. and, and community colleges. So a huge amount of institutional work left to do. And then finally, uh, we can't emphasize too strongly that inclusive excellence has to be very deliberate <laughs> about building the capacity to engage diversity, taking that seriously as one of the core goals of liberal education. And the people who are a part of this, starting with Grant uh, and Richard and, and you, Lynn, and Dan, uh, and so many of our colleagues ac across higher education have built that uh, what, that repertoire of capacities helped us understand that what we need to really prepare students for is civic problem solving. Not just service, not just engagement, but problem solving. Because so we have a lot of problems to solve as a divided and still, still inequitable democracy. And we need to spend time in college exploring those issues. So can I build on that for a second? Yeah. So, uh, thank you for saying that was eloquent. And, and so, the work that I'm in, most interested in is, is kind of circling back away. This is where I've come the last number of years, is to say not only do we want our institutions, as Carol has so eloquently stated, to be places that are open, that there's access, that there's success, that all the high impact practices which you're doing here and our places are paramount or indelible, but we have to prepare students to get here. Uh, and it's not just the high schools. I want to I want to travel back down to pre-K, all the way through that third grade reading test, mm -hmm. back into math skills and the like, all the way through uh, through elementary, middle, and then into high school. So I had this experience. We have this partnership that we're doing with one community on Staten Island. It is about about fourteen thousand people in this one little community <laughs> neighborhood. New York is big. Uh, and this is a neighborhood of sixty to sixty five percent undocumented Mexicans. 20% African Americans, the rest white ethnic New Yorkers. And we've partnered in a very intentional, strategic way, tw 12 months a year, 24 seven, not just to the rhythms of service learning. But anyway, we, and we have a, a very strong commitment to developing high school students and then into the early grades and tutoring and mentoring and things I'm sure many of the things you're doing here, but trying to do it more strategically with targeted outcomes. Um, and we don't get many students initially from this high school. This, Port, this is a neighborhood called Port Richmond, Port Richmond High School. Very few come in the past had come to Wagner. It was not a place, they, it was not a destination for them. But the reason I'm going to say something is that, so we've been working really hard on this pipeline model. How do our students, as they learn what it means to be an engaged citizen, our faculty, our staff, our leaders like myself, work in this community with our partners, not-for-profit not partners, churches, schools, foundations, corporations, whatever it might be, uh, to really see the outcomes be more paramount in terms of success all the way through and support families and the like. But I had this experience. I asked for a meeting at the high school, the local high school, with my biggest partner is the local high school principal in this one area of this partnership, and said, you know, let's talk about getting all the principals and assistant principals together from pre-K all the way through to us. And let's begin about really talking about the passages from pre-K to be successful kindergarten, successful first grader, third grader, seventh grader, from, from elementary to middle school passages, from middle school to be successful high school students. Talk about that. 
So we get to the, the meeting, and uh, this high school has, by the way, the largest culinary program in the city, so the kids were making, students were making us lunch. It was a really wonderful moment of integrated learning. <laughs> and um, the high school principal got up, and this made my day, made my year. He said, well, you know, Wagner sends all this army of folks into our school. They have an office here. They're here six days a week. Uh, we've helped us start a clinic. They've helped us do X, Y, and Z. I won't go through the whole retinue. And, and he said, but now I want my high school students to do for the middle school what Wagner students are doing with us mm -hmm. in the high school. When mm -hmm. I heard that, that pipeline traveling down, that's an, an essential part of being able to have eye impact practices in the lower grades. And that's, that's my point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. That's great. Dan, one of the challenges we see um, in the college presidency, and I know you've been a president of two different colleges, um, is that there's a threat to liberal learning that comes from an unwillingness to engage in the possibility that some of our most fundamental, uh, fundamentally held beliefs might actually be mistaken. And so this trend toward uh, people disinviting commencement speakers or shouting down people with dissenting views, how do we move forward to ensure that the free exchange of ideas is preserved at institutions like Rollins? So how come you picked me to? <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I guess the only thing, the only honest way to start is that I too am a sinner, you know, so that, that, the, uh, that uh, sort of my own thinking about this and approaches to this has been a journey. Um, and uh, I would uh, say that we're at a, an especially perilous time with regard to these, to these questions on campuses now that, uh, uh, and, and it's more perilous because I don't think we paid enough attention to, to uh, talking about the, 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 the skills necessary and the kinds of ideals that we have for discussing awkward and difficult uh, issues. Um, and especially when uh, evidence leads one way as a, and maybe beliefs and ideologies lead, lead another way. And so when you, when you find yourself in a, in a quandary because something has blown up, you don't have the ability quickly to go back and teach everybody the skills <laughs> that would help us all get through it. So I, I won't comment on managing short-term crises, but I do think that uh, it's, it's like uh, you know, having a good breakfast every day. We have to build into the fabric of our institutions uh, sort of continuous uh, attention to, to developing those skills, not just in our students, but in ourselves. Uh, uh, students uh, watch how we treat each other. Uh, the, the, the last thing you'd really want in, on most campuses is, uh, is to have students be observers at faculty meetings, uh, where, where, we, where, we, where we aren't modeling very well often these, these kinds of skills. So it's just a, it's, it, it's just got, and there's no easy answer to it. It's, uh, but we, it's, it's like what I was saying earlier about critical thinking and other learning goals. Unless, unless you make it uh, a learning goal for the, for the community, unless you, um, as you would in a class, design assignments and, and sort of guided, uh, guided learning around these things and build some mechanisms for doing that, you, you, we're just never gonna get there. And it's, it's gonna be messy all the way along, no matter, no matter what, because if you go back and read what I think is the, is the most uh, powerful essay on this, it's Milton's Areopagetica, which is a defense of the freedom to publish, which was, which was pub I think he wrote it in the late, 16, late 1600s. And, and one of the things he says, of course, is that, uh, uh, that, that debate and discussion in a free society is going to be messy, it's going to be conflictual, it's going to be, uh, problematic. There, there, uh, evidence will come down on both sides of the question, uh, and many questions are not resolved for mm -hmm. for decades because the evidence is conflicting. So how do we how do we do that? Um, that's that's the best I can I can do, and I'm hoping one of my colleagues will rescue <laughs> me from this. Well, of course, I, uh, uh, yes. uh, I agree. I think pretty strongly with what Dan has said, and I I, I want to elaborate it a little further. I talked before about how we've moved away as a society 
from any discussion of the public square, of our public yeah. responsibilities to one another. Mm -hmm. It's just not something we're, not a dialogue we're having very robustly uh, in, in the public, and that affects then what people think college is for. We did some focus groups a few years ago, and I should mention this to you, uh, and we put a whole set of possible goals for learning on a list and gave them to students, college-bound students and students in college, not Rollins, but in other parts of the country. Um, and we asked the students to say what were the top five goals for themselves and the three least important goals for themselves on this list. And we were stunned and appalled, frankly, to see civic learning right down there at the bottom. Um, so these are focus groups, and the focus group leader asked uh, why students had signaled this as unimportant. And the answer was, um, it's not that we think it's unimportant, but we've already done that in high school. It means, but we assume it means voting. <laughs> we know we're supposed to vote. Been there, understand that, nothing further to do in college. College is not about civic learning, these students in different parts of the country mm -hmm. assured us. Uh, and again, these were juniors in college and college-bound high school juniors and entering their senior year. So we haven't made the case that there's supposed to be a building of civic capacity to do anything, to engage difficult difference, to hear views that are different from uh, our own, that are to know how to deal with that constructively. We haven't made that case. But, but this, I am an historian in my spare time, this is new. Uh, Obama has been very disappointing, no question on these issues, very disappointing. Uh, but there was the Truman Commission in 1947, which said, and it was owned by the White House, the top goals, three goals for education, its most important purposes for everybody, were building democratic capacity in everyday life, fostering civic uh, international understanding um, and cooperation, and third, building the social imagination and trained intelligence to solve public problems. And I'm quoting almost verbatim, to solve public problems. Not to solve the problem of getting a job, <laughs> but to solve the problems. This is 1947. We were a segregated society. We had just desegregated the military. This whole report, six volumes, was about trying to do something about the inequities in our society through education, mm -hmm. giving a big leap forward to community colleges. We've lost all that, and, and educated citizens need to fight to get it back. Mm -hmm. We can't solve the problems we need to solve unless people can see that there's a connection between college and the vitality of our democracy, and they do not see that. Mm. Well, there's certainly been a, a good deal of engagement on the part of students with protests around Black Lives Matter, other issues of social and racial justice. Um, one thing that's changed from Milton's time is, is social media and the way in which <laughs> roving strangers um, are agitating on our college campuses. And, and so that does complicate matters. Um, I'm gonna stop here, you've been brilliant, um, but I want to make sure that the audience has a chance to ask questions. Great, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, many feel that some number of small liberal arts schools will fail and close in the next decade or so. Do you see that happening and why or why not? Uh, I think we're going to see some schools close. You know, we're an industry that doesn't have mergers and acquisitions, at least not up to this point. Um, but there are a lot of providers in a market that's particularly in the private space, which is very complicated. And, uh, and as we know, the discount wars are prevalent everywhere. So um, what I'd love to see happen, personally, I spent some time trying to get this to happen with the New American Colleges, uh, which, by the way, Rollins was a founding member and then left, and maybe at some point you'll come back. Which is, the <laughs> which is the whole way in which um, you know, Boyer had imagined a different kind of educational mm -hmm. system, which integrated liberal, liberal learning and liberal education and professional studies into a robust, what I call a Wagner, mm -hmm. practical liberal arts. Um, but I, 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 I would say this, that um, we need to develop in schools that are struggling networks. Think about, hospital, think about how hospitals put networks together and share resources and really be able to get economies of scale at the very small places. Uh, and now with virtual learning we can, and virtual ways of connecting, not just virtual learning, we can do things together that we hadn't possibly thought about doing before. Mm -hmm. But I do think this is a pernicious <coughs> economic environment. Um, 
and we have to face up to it. Uh, and that is one of the challenges. As a, I'm at a place which is, you know, a small endowed place. We're not we're not hugely endowed. We've we're relatively young, and we struggle every day with access issues and performance and quality education and giving folks a raise and all the normal things that you struggle with. And that's where most of higher education is. So. I, I I have a I think history is a is a is a useful thing for all sorts of things, One, and it's certainly useful on this question. In the early 1970s, we were, we were facing uh, an absolutely certain 35% decline in the number of high school graduates over the next 10 or 15 years. How did we know it was certain? Because everybody was born already. And, and you, could see it, you could see it coming. So, so there was a, yes. not everybody was born, but I mean, the certain thing <laughs> And so, so there was this uh, sort of national uh, doomsday scenario that, that hundreds of private colleges were going to, were going to close. And, and uh, I was a real skeptic on, on that. And I was a skeptic. Uh, one reason I was a skeptic is that I, I felt people don't get how committed the faculty and staff and the, and the stakeholders mm -hmm. of private colleges are. And they're willing to suffer in order to keep the, the mission alive and wait for a better day or to uh, suffer until their adjustments that they, that, they are, that they need to make begin to pay off. And so, so I think the, the number of colleges that closed in response to that 35% decline was like 10 or 15 over, over the course of a, of a decade. But the other thing that was just striking, you, when, you, when you look at the graphs, it just blows you away. If you look at the number of high school graduates, you see that 35% decline. If you look at college enrollments nationally, you see a slight def deflection in the slope of growth. But enrollments grew steadily throughout that, throughout that period of time, despite, and so how did that happen? Well, colleges all of a sudden, many, many colleges thought, you know, even women might be able to learn. <laughs> so, so they went and they, they, they thought it would be okay if they, if they, they <laughs> recruited more women. Uh, they, they thought that maybe even people who were uh, not as well prepared as uh, people that went to Harvard might, with a little bit of adjustment, be able to, to learn more. That maybe people who weren't traditional age had learned everything yet that they, mm -hmm. that they needed in their lives and, and uh, that lifelong learning should be something we should take seriously. And so uh, the, the inclusiveness that we now see, and we need a lot more of it in American higher education, was driven hugely by the necessity to keep open during a time of a 35% decline. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think what you're seeing now already, the, the, there's a lot of crazy experimentation going on. I mean, we could talk for hours about the, mm -hmm. and Carol and I do talk for hours about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but there's, there's a great deal of very exciting experimentation that has its eye on the, on the right outcomes, and it has its eye on discovering new ways to, and better ways to uh, produce those outcomes. And so I'm, I, yes, there will be some, some places that will close, that ought to close, but my, my guess is that uh, we're gonna see another, if we look back on it, if I'm lucky enough to look back on it uh, in 20 years, I think we'll see this as a period of substantial uh, Adjustment isn't the right word, but sort of creative uh, reconfiguration and hopefully reconfiguration focused on the kinds of goals that, that we've been articulating. Just to, to build on uh, that and uh, take it just a little further, um, I want to underscore what you've said about the connection between becoming more inclusive and becoming more innovative in response to mm -hmm. um, economic anxiety, frankly. Uh, it's in the 70s, exactly in that period, that AAC and you got over the notion, put it behind on a shelf, that the only place you could get a liberal education was in certain disciplines. Yes. In the arts and sciences. <laughs> we threw open our doors to all parts of the academy, to the students studying professional fields, career and technical fields, engineering. We, have, we created a bigger tent for what we meant by liberal education. Uh, and, and have benefited as a community from so much innovation, and the New American Colleges and Universities is part of that, specifically designed to pull together 
the strengths of what I think of as the analytical fields, the traditional arts and sciences, and the applied fields, where you're actually figuring out what to do with your knowledge. Each needs the other. We need that big picture thinking. We need that experimentation with what it means to apply knowledge. Uh, there, and we are still at the beginning stage of that creative synergy between the professional fields and the so-called traditional arts and sciences fields. And there's so much more that can be done. And I am looking to Rollins <laughs> to become a shining beacon of what can be done. You're, you have this tradition of experimentation, of hands-on pragmatic learning. Uh, and you have a president who does not tend to keep uh, the exciting things his institution does to himself. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I am looking, I'll say this again tomorrow when I introduce you, uh, to Rollins to be a shining beacon of exactly that innovation in the direction of, of experimentation, inclusion, and creating more powerful versions of liberal mm -hmm. arts institutions. Yeah, and can I just say one last thing on this? this is, I'm, I'm glad you said this because uh, we're here because we love what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. And um, how can I put this politely? I won't put it politely. Um, <laughs> you need to be more of a national leader because there's a lot to learn from Wagner, from uh, Rollins, places like <laughs> Wagner. <laughs> Wagner you can learn from. <laughs> I was with a colleague of mine who said to me the other day, the president of the chancellor of the University of Nebraska, Omaha, John Christensen, who was a great dry sense of humor. We were mm -hmm. getting introduced mm -hmm. and he said, I I'm so old, the Dead Sea was blue when I was born. <laughs> so, if you get a little older, these things happen. Um, but as you work out some of the issues that you're dealing with, I, mean, I know that you're dealing with this whole notion of professional and liberal and how these pieces go together. That's a fascinating conversation for most places. When there's a lot of work been done on that. But don't be shy about saying, this is, we're trying to come to grips with this in some way. You'll learn as well as we'll learn from you in terms of how you engage that. Your civic and global kinds of citizenship pieces are important to be a voice nationally. And you will learn from other places as, as you give generously in terms of what you're doing here. So I would just echo what you're saying is to be a national. And every place that I've been at where we've made progress is because we've participated very vigorously at the national level. And, and, and my, what I mean is bringing faculty and staff to large, in large numbers to lots of meetings where they grew and they could see beyond the borders of their own campus and realize the value of what they're doing, as well as gain new knowledge and new perspectives. I think there's real opportunity. I'm fortunate to be in the Pioneer Valley in Western Massachusetts where we're, Mount Holyoke is part of a five college consortium with UMass Amherst, Amherst College, Smith College, and Hampshire. And we do share faculty, staff, uh, 7,000 students every year take classes on other campuses, and I think that is a trend that we should pay attention to, and, and Rollins can play a leadership role in that. So Carol, um, inclusive excellence, only the excellent need apply? <laughs> How can liberal arts institutions connect with and include white Americans who either did not attend college or did not achieve excellence in college? <clears throat> Oh, that's a book, isn't it, uh, to answer that question. Certainly, it's, uh, if, if you mean by excellent, people who've had the good fortune to either be born into um, financial advantage or uh, to be sufficiently talented that they overcame the disparities that are built into our educational system at all levels. If you mean by that, uh, that's who uh, inclusive excellence is for? No, not at all. The whole point of let me say um, something to you that I've said in public elsewhere. Um, my grandfather was a, one of them, a janitor in the post office, and the other had a, he was an immigrant and he had an eighth grade education, he was a printer. Um, I have a PhD. I do not assume that I am more talented than my grandparents. I assume that I was more fortunate than my grandparents, and that in between was a father who actually managed to be the only one of eight siblings who finished high school, finished college, got a PhD himself, and was pushing me every step of the way to actually work hard and, and take advantage of, of educational opportunities. So I was pushed. I am not more inherently talented than grandparents who didn't have an education. Our nation is full of untapped talent, full of untapped talent. Uh, and we have the opportunity as educational as educators and educational institutions to help our society see that capacity is developed. It's not an, uh, uh, an act of fortune. Uh, and our society doesn't believe this. I, I, when I was still at the University of Chicago, I 
worked with some people who were studying Japanese education at the elementary level. Uh, and they were trying to show the difference between Japanese schools with their assumption that everybody could get it. And American schools, where you can show empirically that a lot of the teachers don't think everybody's going to get it, and they're sorting. They're sorting early on. So we as, we as a society, for all our embrace of equality, as uh, equal opportunity as two of our commitments, we have a whole lot of assumptions that are built into our mindset that reinforce disparity, inequity, et cetera, et cetera. And we have the op opportunity and obligation, I think, to help change that mindset. Mm -hmm. Nothing is more fundamental than changing minds about who has the potential to succeed, mm -hmm. because most people do. I think this next question ties into how we can do that. What's our local role as public intellectuals in influencing opinion and action? Mm -hmm. I chair the uh, AAC and U Presidents Trust, which is a group of 100 presidents who, who agree to, to sort of step forward and participate <laughs> with AAC and U uh, and, be, and become uh, fuller and, uh, and more complete public spokespersons for, for this kind of education on their campuses and their regions and their states. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that, that the, there's so little of this kind of speaking out and, and public leadership going on. We have to get ourselves to do this. So I, whenever I talk to groups of faculty and administrators, I, I mean, every one of us is a citizen. Every one of us is a, has opportunities to, to, uh, to influence the public dialogue about, about things. And, and of course, to model civic discourse, which is, uh, if, if, if we can, you know, some of us have, <laughs> have uh, uh, flaws in that regard, including, my, including myself. So I, I think, uh, so AEC and U has tried to take that on as well and begin to expand the number of, of uh, its members and their leaders who, who take this role. And again, it's, it's dripping water on the stone. There's no, there's no knob to turn to get from here to there without the hard work uh, in, in between. And, and, but it has to be built into the fabric of, of who we are and what we do in our institutions uh, uh, just as much as any, any other critical outcome, anything that we, that we need to do, I guess. There's no easy answer. So I would just say, um, um, you may have heard the term anchor institution. Some of you heard this. So I'm privileged to sit on the steering committee of the Anchor Institutions Task Force. And this came out of the University of Pennsylvania predominantly, but now it's quite a wide uh, uh, ind individual membership organization. But it's the concept which is so compelling, and I see it actually uh, traveling internationally in terms of the conferences I've been to. And this notion is that learning and, and, and location are linked, and that we are, we are citizens of our locations. And I don't just mean the place we formally sit here on this campus, but all of our locations abroad, so to speak, and that when you, a concept of, of linking us as one of the institutions, we're not leaving, we're not corporations which are moving abroad or other parts of the United States, that we are here to stay, that we are one of the anchors, hospitals, churches, all kinds of community organizations, the not-for-profit community are also anchors of the high schools and, and the, so on. And so with that, just as you think about global citizenship as one of the keys of a Rollins education or a liberal education, the notion that you're an anchor institution in the community in which you reside. You may also be an anchor institution in communities which you affiliate with internationally. You're not the primary anchor there, but you are an anchor, is an important concept, the way to conceive of the obligations we have and the way to organize the work of what we're doing in teaching and learning scholarship and the like. Excellent. How do you think a newly established education curricula such as Common Core Math will impact liberal arts colleges in the future. Do you think that there will be a positive or negative impact? I think, I think Dan's a mathematician. He hmm. I mean, that's, that's, a really, that's a really complicated problem. I think the, I think the goal of a Common Core, the notion, the notion that uh, K-12 education has, has not been demanding enough, not been uh, as, ex, as ex, not been demanding enough, I guess is one way to say it, and to try to build into, into high school curricula expectations for, for teaching and learning for everyone that, are, that sort of build on what Carol said uh, is there. So I think that, that part of the Common Core movement has been, been important and helpful. The linkage of that movement to standardized testing uh, 
has been uh, has has been a bad thing, uh, and which is which is why I mean it would take it would take more time than we have for me to explain to you in in any detail the approach to assessment that AEC and U is championing. But but it begins with students' own work, it uses rubrics to assess that work. Uh, the rubrics are meant to be common so that you can compare uh, how well someone does in critical thinking uh, at one institution. Uh, uh, to how well students do at another. You can compare how well students do at critical thinking in their first year in college to how well they do later on and, and aggregate these, uh, these data together. And I think, um, so th what's, what's happening as a result of the national allergic reaction to a dramatic increase in standardized testing is that I think uh, we, we're, we're now deciding that, that states get you know, get to decide uh, what students will learn at local school boards. And we, we of course, set K-12 education up that way. It's not a federal responsibility. It's a state and local responsibility. I think uh, it, was a, it was a good idea, not, not, not necessarily well executed, and we're gonna have some painful years um, moving to whatever the next thing is. And, and uh, I don't think moving to what the last thing was is going to be the solution, and that's that's probably where we're headed. So, so one of the things that's going on as I look toward in the last two and a half months before I retire is that I'm constantly thinking of things my successor should do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. We are too. <laughs> and here she is. So, <laughs> so as Dan was talking, the following thoughts were coalescing in my mind. Uh, yes, there is a movement in higher education toward putting students' work on the table as the primary evidence of what they're getting out of college. And we have been trying to drive that as an association, but we're certainly not alone in it. Um, secondly, the head of the college board is, is on board with, uh, which of course is responsible for all that pre-collegiate testing, uh, is on board with that idea. He helped write the Common Core Standards, and they were all about getting students involved before they get to college mm -hmm. in doing research, doing more writing, doing more analysis, using more, more varied kinds of text, doing more projects. The idea of project-based, hands-on, active work, a specialty at Rollins, uh, is built into the Common Core as intended, and that idea is known to and owned by the head of the college board, uh, and it's built into higher education's most exciting reform movements, getting students more involved in doing what we call high impact practices, more research, more projects, more civic problem solving, and so on. And it's built into an emerging design for assessment. So I think there's actually an opportunity for AAC and you in the future to <laughs> join Take hands the with uh, the I college agree. board uh, around the notion that student work is primary. And let me say a couple more things about, about this. Um, there's a guy, there's a debate going on that you don't want to know about as to whether learning outcomes are getting in the way of meaningful student work. But the person driving that, the person who's really arguing for more attention to student work, is one of the handful of key advisors to the Clinton campaign. Mm -hmm. So in the event that that becomes the uh, winning party, and we don't know that, of course, um, Bob Shireman, specifically, is really on the warpath for student work to matter. Mm -hmm. And there's two pieces of this. One that we really, especially faculty here, need to think about, students too. Um, in a whole lot of higher education, we don't give students much student work. They take a course, there's a midterm, there's a final. And a lot of those midterms are multiple choice. Some of those finals are multiple choice developing none of the capacities that are actually key to a liberal education. It's in private colleges like this that students are really most likely to have lots of papers, lots of projects, lots of meaningful work. So the more student work comes onto the national radar screen as the dividing line between whether students are really getting what they need for a complex world, then uh, the private colleges like Rollins will have, be way ahead of the game and when we start looking, we know from the experiments we're doing now with assessment of student work, that sometimes you can't find the assignments you want to assess because students aren't being asked to do them <laughs> in fields where you would think they would be there. I'm thinking of right quantitative reasoning assignments in economics and biology and psychology. They had to be invented before we could assess them. Mm. 
um, in public institutions, mm -hmm. specifically public institutions. So there's, the more we can push this notion that student work, the right kind of student work is the key to a quality education mm -hmm. and to the evidence about what students are learning, the better off we'll be. And I can see the politics starting to <laughs> coalesce slightly on that, and, I, and good luck with it. <laughs> yes, well, thank you. I, one of the challenges that you've reinforced over and over again is that these types of standardized tests often ask students to solve problems for which we already know the answers. Exactly. What we need are problems <laughs> solved that, for which we don't have the answers. Precisely. And to give them the skills grappling with those right. unanswerable, exactly. unanswerable questions. Right. Right or unanswered to this point. Unanswered to this point, yeah. Yes. Um, didn't the 2014 AAC and new study on income of liberal education graduates find that liberal arts students only caught up to professionally educated students if they went back to school and received professional training at the graduate level? Otherwise, this never made up the difference in income, a $500,000 difference over a lifetime? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not what we found. I, I am not, I'm going to recommend that you get the study if, you want, if you're interested in it. We have it available still. Uh, just go to our website and, and look for uh, how liberal arts graduates fare in the job market. I think that's the name of it. Uh, but it was for the students who didn't go on to graduate school uh, where the uh, liberal arts group caught up with professional students uh, and slightly exceeded them. Um, they never exceeded the science students, and they never, ex certainly none of the above exceeded the engineers. Um, there's no question that there's a big bump up for everybody to, from getting the graduate degree in terms of the salary, absolutely. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that liberal arts graduates did, did well over time and did, if it matters to one, a little better. <laughs> than a comparison group uh, as they got to the midpoint of their careers. But I, so. but I think the, the uh, again, we're sort of, sort of responding to, to uh, the wrong question. We have to respond to it. Um, and I think, I think you know this is, this is true here. It's true, it's true at St. Lawrence and, and, and Allegheny. We do, uh, we pay not enough attention to the, uh, and we're not explicit of it enough and intentional enough uh, in our courses in the liberal arts disciplines to ensure that students taking classics as a major or philosophy as a major, actually uh, there, are, there are assignments designed to build these skills and not just understand what Plato believed and Aristotle uh, believed. So, so um, I think the, the, the data aren't as clean as I would like them to be largely because it's not because uh, the students are majoring necessarily in in disciplines that have no use, but we're not we're not building the the skills even in those even in those courses. But the other, just just to say, one of the things that uh, I'll just give you one example that, that drove me crazy in Minnesota. There are two Catholic colleges in in northern Minnesota. One was a women's college. One was a men's college. About 10, 15 years ago, they completely merged their curricula. Their faculty are common. They still have separate boards of trustees and separate presidents at St. John's and St. Ben's. And um, in Minnesota, the, the college whose graduates have the highest salaries uh, are graduates of St. John's, and the, and the, the, students whose grad, the college whose students have the lowest salaries are the graduates of St. Ben's. Mm -hmm. and, and yet the, the campus, it's the same college, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the same curriculum. Um, and, and so what you see are differences in, uh, by gender in job choices that lead to, in, to, to different economic outcomes. I suspect, I'm not sure about this, I suspect there's still some discrimination in the world that even, even <laughs> equally prepared and uh, <laughs> that women, women uh, employed in exactly the same job sometimes make less than, mm -hmm. than equivalent men in those jobs. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, this, uh, so, so on the one hand, there, you know, we can't let ourselves get caught up in that. The other, the other places, I, and I, Carol, we, we struggle with this all at the same time, all, all the time at ACNU. We aren't doing this right yet by a long shot. And, and, and mm -hmm. when we do get it, get it right, it won't matter whether you majored in a, in a discipline whose, whose content isn't 
wildly popular in the market. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to find a job uh, based entirely on what you know of Plato. You know, it just really is. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if you can write and Some think. Some of us have done it. And, and engage. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's hard. Well, yeah. You know, the, the economy. There, the, the ones who do are doing fine. Yeah. You know, but it's not. A, but it's not a big, not a big thing. And so that's the wrong argument. We uh, to, to the place, and we have to. We have to make sure that those students who've chosen for all sorts of good reasons for them, and for the for their aspirations for their life, have chosen to major in in a discipline whose content doesn't lead directly to to jobs. Uh, leave college with the same kinds of skills. And the flip side of it is that the, those who do cho choose to major in those other also get uh, uh, skills like uh, you know, knowing how to, how to function in diverse work groups and, mm -hmm. and uh, all of those kinds of things. So uh, I think, I'm an optimist, I think that eventually the entire country will see the wisdom of Carol's <laughs> views on these questions, and there will be a sort of miraculous sea change. And Birth experience, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, let's not wait for that to happen, but, um, <laughs> but I do want to um, underscore a point that's implicit in what we've been saying, and it's this. As a, as a community, we have got to stop fetishizing the major. Yes. 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 A liberal education is and always has been about the blended learning sure. mm -hmm. from different areas of study. And the US has been a world leader in insisting that you don't go to college just to study one field. Now there's complex reasons why we've done that, but nonetheless, that's our signature. It's the blend of the major, the broad learning, and as Dan has just said very clearly, and I'll say it again, across all those fields, making sure that certain kinds of intellectual skills including the ability to deal with difference and ethical reasoning are built into whatever you're studying and everything you're studying, and that everybody is practicing applying that complicated learning <coughs> to complex problems. That's, to my mind, where we have to position ourselves as a community, as liberal arts institutions, but as a higher education community. Right now, there's a big movement, and this is one of the things we're so unhappy with the Obama administration about, toward rating how, well, how good the program was based on how much you made uh, according only to what you majored in, as though everything else yes. were irrelevant. That first job, right. Everything else were irrelevant. Right. Now, Lynn will soon find herself in rooms where people are talking about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Currently, they say, now we know Carol will object. Uh, <laughs> and I do object profoundly. I want to be hearing <laughs> yes. that we're all objecting to the notion that the major is the only thing that counts because it's the distinctive strength mm -hmm. of our community, of our liberal education community, to pull together insights from different sources, connect them, think about their implications, and apply them. Mm -hmm. And if we lose that while we're busy getting good metrics for a return on investment in certain majors, if we lose that, we lose the future. I believe that profoundly, and I think we need to argue that profoundly as an educational community. It's the blend that matters, yeah. not the major. You know, I, I, we do well uh, at Wagner on those statistics because we have some professional programs that start at higher salaries. And when I was asked by somebody from the state government uh, what I thought about you know, our success in this area and measuring you know, these wonderful returns on this first job, I said, well, thank God I'm not running a seminary because our salaries would be impossible for the rest right. of their lives and we would look like failures, right. even though we might be producing some wonderful clergy, right, as you right. looked earlier point. So I couldn't agree with you more. One last thing I would just add to this is as we think about the arc of an entire undergraduate education, let's not forget the co-curricular piece and all the stuff that happens outside the classroom, which need to have the same rigor mm -hmm. in terms of understanding what we're doing there, what kinds of outcomes. My colleagues on the student affairs side are, are, there's an emerging generation of folks who are very sensitive to outcomes in terms of leadership, diversity education, civic learning, all these different pieces in residence life all the way over to the civic world and everything in between. 
there's another form of learning that has to be linked back to the formal curriculum. If you're studying Plato, you're studying something about life that actually in some way gives you a context to understand as an RA why certain things are happening and what your response should be mm -hmm. as an RA. I mean, you, yes. you'd hope those two worlds would connect. And so we have to be <laughs> intentional about how we link learning broadly as educational outcomes. In and our even lives. in intercollegiate athletics, there yeah, need to course. be learning goals in yes. intercollegiate athletics. Of course. Yeah. And, and uh, just to build on the point that you two have made, uh, the recent Gallup-Purdue study shows that 10 years out, the factors that help students thrive the most in the workplace are, this kind, are these kinds of engaged learning right. processes, the, the high-impact practices that take place every day on this campus. Right. Thank you. But otherwise, we have no views. <laughs> Well, I hope you've enjoyed that as much as I did. That was a wonderful discussion. I want to thank Drs. Garassi, Schneider, Sullivan, and Pascarello for your wonderful insights, for everything you've shared with us. And there will be a brief 15-minute inter intermission, and we will reconvene at about 2.30. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>